pretty good to me. And it's recording, so we'll have to start. Uh, welcome, Paul Hudson from the Transdisciplinary Center for Research in Psychoactive Substances. This is the Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences group meeting at UW Space Place in Madison, Wisconsin. Paul, I'm going to ask you the five questions. Where were you born? I was born in California. Where? Uh, Southern California, Pasadena. Whoa. Grew up in Southern Cal, moved uh, to Seattle for pharmacy school and master's in chemistry, and then to Memphis uh, for a doctor of pharmacy degree. Uh, two years of fellowship at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and then University of Illinois, Chicago for five years before I was recruited up here in 1988. So I'm, I just celebrated my 33rd anniversary here at the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. There you go. Fantastic. Long time. Well, thank you for coming today and go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you everybody for coming today and those online. Thank you for viewing this. I've been asked to come and talk to you about some of the things that we're doing at the new transdisciplinary center for research in psychoactive substances, which is a mouthful. I'll explain why it's uh, such a mouthful as we go. But I wanted to just uh, provide some background a little bit in terms of the psychoactive or psychedelic agents that we're working on, and then touching also on the, the studies that we're doing here in Madison. And let's see, I assume he locked. There we go. So these are the studies that we have underway at present. The one in gray at the top, the pharmacokinetics and safety of escalating doses of psilocybin is already completed. And this is the one that pretty much defined the dose of psilocybin moving forward in clinical studies. I'll talk about some of these others in a bit, but I wanted to get, give you a sense of some of the scope of things that we're looking at as uh, I get into it. And I'll be talking about primarily psilocybin and MDMA, but I want you to realize that there are multiple psychoactive or psychedelic agents that are being studied in various ways right now. I'm going to be looking um, at, again, psilocybin and uh, the intactogen MDMA or ecstasy. But I have in green here the, 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 the psychedelics that are derived from plants. And I want you to be thinking about this, that we have a, a series of compounds that are derived from plants. And that is going to be a question that uh, companies that, and, that are trying to develop these compounds are going to have to grapple with. These are natural substances, many of them. And how are you going to protect your intellectual property moving forward when most of these agents can be extracted from plants if necessary? So I'm first going to be talking about MDMA for PTSD real briefly. This is a really encouraging uh, drug. It is being studied by the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, and they have already published the first of their registration trials, what we would call a phase three trial, comparing it against a standard, if you will, uh, in this case, placebo, because we really uh, don't really have strong drugs for PTSD. And what they found is that when you add MDMA to a somewhat protocolized psychotherapy process with trained psychologists to psychiatrists, interacting with these individuals over a period of time and receiving uh, typically three doses of MDMA about a month apart, that the percent of patients that are in remission that no longer satisfy the, the criteria to be diagnosed as having PTSD increases dramatically. You can see that in this uh, graph, we go from about 5% now in remission to about 30%, actually even higher. So about a six-fold increase and the number of individuals who no longer manifest the symptoms of PTSD. This is really encouraging. And that's after three treatments? This is after three treatments, a month apart, plus the active psychotherapy, about 40 hours total Continued of psychotherapy. And hopefully they would not be let go completely from, some, from analysis or the opportunity to talk about their issues. But yes, three doses. And one of the things that we're grappling with is that this study, even with their best attempts, was really heavily weighted uh, on the white population. 
and that we really don't have a very good representation of black and other underserved populations, which is one of the criticisms of, of this drug. Nevertheless, the FDA has designated MDMA as a breakthrough drug, which means that the FDA is, feels that this is a novel agent uh, meeting an unmet need, and that instead of sort of having a show me, prove it to me attitude, the FDA is actually, uh, by designating, designating this as a breakthrough drug, the FDA is basically saying, we will help you move this forward. Really? We will facilitate things, which is really nice to have. Um, I mentioned the psychotherapy. Do they have to change any of the national rules against, in order to say that? Do they have to change rules? Uh, for the FDA's? Because no. for 30 years, we have been banned from even doing much research on it. The FDA does not need to change the rules. It is treating this like any other investigational drug. The rules that have to be sort of met that are unusual are permission to handle a schedule one drug that is considered to be illegal to possess otherwise. Mm -hmm. And this is requiring not only FDA approval to use this as an investigational drug, but state approval from the Controlled Substances Board and the Drug Enforcement Agency. Having said that, for neither the MDMA or the psilocybin work that we've done or, and are doing, have they really been resistant or provided any pushback? I have actually had some informal conversations with uh, staff from the FDA and the controlled substances section. And they've said, you know, we're really rather excited about this work. We just don't want you to uh, get lazy or careless and start cutting corners. What about the state legislature? Uh, we have not had any interactions whatsoever with the state legislature yet. <clears throat> and we're hoping that, that, uh, that when we, well, well, actually, no. Um, I'm going to be talking about that in a bit, okay. because I think that it's going to be an important uh, factor to have. Uh, it's important to have them in our, on our side. And we've kind of kept a low profile here in Madison. Uh, but I think that we've been in the press several times in the past seven years. I haven't had any real, uh, any contacts with the legislature at all. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to point out before I move away from MDMA, the complexity of the, the clinical trial. And you see the interactions that they have, integration sessions after each of these dosing sessions, which are in red. So you see three dosing sessions. There is a taper off of any medications that they're on, multiple orange preparatory sessions that provide the, uh, expectations that the, the patient should have, how we're going to be interacting with them um, on a moment-to-moment uh, um, a, a -moment basis during their session, quite honestly. This requires a lot of back and forth, a lot of time on the part of not only the patient, but also on the two therapists. And this is one of the barriers, actually, that we're going to run into is the time required for psychotherapy uh, enhanced by MDMA and or psilocybin. So keep that in mind as well, the complexity of these things. But most of our work so far has been with psilocybin, but we're not the first to be looking at this as a, a therapeutic agent or a, uh, a agent that has particular uh, properties. You see some of these Mesoamerican uh, icons, some sculptures, some graphics that <clears throat> idolize and uh, memorialize the, uh, the mushroom that you see here, psilocybin's mushroom. Actually, I think this one down here looks more like a viral phage than uh, <laughs> anything else, but, but you see the, the, the mushroom theme here. And this scary bee man or, or hornet man also seems to be approaching the subject, but also uh, perhaps the, the association is with the mushrooms that cause this, this creature to appear in their vision. So we're not the first, but there is really encouraging data to uh, support the use of psilocybin as a therapeutic agent, not just a ceremonial agent. This is work that was reported from the Johns Hopkins group uh, several years ago. And they've looked at depression scores and anxiety scores. And depression, the graph on the left, anxiety on the right. And they gave a low dose of psilocybin to try to make it a placebo. And it was uh, about one milligram with really no substantial effects or noticeable uh, effects at all, as I understand it. And they also gave a high dose, which was about 25 milligrams, about the same dose that we used as our in our uh, 
clinical trials, we were trying to find the, the safe doses. What they found was that basically uh, about a month after the first session, that the percentage of patients who had a remission, if you will, of their depression, who were no longer satisfying the criteria for having a diagnosis of being depressed, increased dramatically by about threefold. And then you can see here that this was true for both depression and anxiety. And what's also interesting is that instead of this one dose having a, an effect that wore off, six months later, the, the patients actually seem to improve as a whole. For those patients who responded, they seem to get better over time. Another study that was done by Robin Carhart Harris when he was in London, now he's at uh, uh, Berkeley, showed that the Beck depression index dropped dramatically for most, but not all patients. This is not a panacea, it doesn't work for everybody. But most of these individuals fell into a, a no depression category where they no longer satisfied criteria for being defined as having depression. And this happened very quickly, within one week, as opposed to weeks or months for most of our traditional non uh, uh, antidepressant drugs like the SSRIs, Prozac, and so on. And you can also see again that for many of these individuals that one uh, dose, that higher dose that they gave um, had a durable effect. And we don't really know whether or not there's a booster needed at six months, three months. That's not been looked at. Most, uh, virtually all of the studies that have been done with depression so far with psilocybin have just used one dose. So how does that compare? to a drug such as sertraline, which is one of our go-to antidepressants. Here are some of the studies that were reported in the registration of this drug. And you can see that we have about a 50, mid 50s response rate, but also notice that there is a high response rate in the group getting placebo. Over a third of the individuals getting a placebo for their depression seem to improve and to respond. In the case of the studies from London and from New York and from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, you can see that the response rate is higher. And at in an extended period of time, 12 weeks, eight months, and six months, that that response rate was maintained after one dose. Why is that? I don't know. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> That's part of the, problem, the issue that we're dealing with. So here again is a list of some of the sessions that one would have to go through if we, they were in the uh, study that was done by Michael Bogenschutz now at the University of uh, uh, New York University. You can see the complexity of these sessions that they have. And also, look, we had 70 patients that were screened and of those only 10 were actually studied because of various screening processes that we used to try to glean those individuals who we think are appropriate for psychedelic dosing and those for whom we don't think it's a right thing to do, a safe thing to do. And he gave, in his case, two doses of psilocybin that were both uh, substantial in their size and their effect. And what he found also <clears throat> rather quickly, as you can see, the drinking days, the percentage of drinking days and the percentage of heavy drinking days in the red here with a square, these all dropped very quickly. And over about half of a year, this was maintained after two doses. But again, you can see that we have underrepresentation of, under, of underserved populations. We need to fix that. And one of the things that we're doing at the center is to try to better understand how we can not only include Blacks and other underserved populations in the research, but if it's as good as we think it's going to be, how to make sure that they have access to this therapy and going forward. Tobacco cessation, the study that was done at Hopkins again um, by Mike, Matt Johnson, 15 patients in the initial study, average of six failed attempts to stop smoking among these individuals. And you can see that in 10 weeks, most of these patients were completely abstinent. And at six months, this was maintained. So at six months, 80%, 12 of these 15 were completely off tobacco nothing in their urine to test to show that they were taking any, any cigarettes. And oh, by the way, they went cold turkey. Their quit date was the first day, the first of their three doses of psilocybin, given a month apart. And 
When they quit, they did not get patches or nicotine gum. They went cold turkey. They just didn't need it anymore. So this is exciting work. And actually based on this, the uh, NIH have provided the first large uh, grant in about 20 to 30 years on psychedelics for Hopkins, New York University and Alabama to look at a larger study of tobacco cessation using psilocybin. So I think that nut has been cracked. The NIH is finally warming up to the idea that these can be useful. So why are we using psilocybin? Uh, we're using psilocybin because it establishes a mystical state. There is a component of a mystical experience that we think is going to be therapeutic. And in some cases, individuals can meditate and have uh, what they consider to be a mystical state. That might happen for a few moments for a trained individual. This allows us to establish a mystical state uh, for hours, quite honestly. And there are components of this mystical state that include uh, a profound insight or awareness and knowledge, a sense of oneness with the universe, uh, with others. It can't really be described though. It's very hard to describe this experience. And even though there may be some difficult components of that session, typically we consider this to be a, uh, a positive thing, that individuals feel that they had a positive experience. And then they also tend to lose track of time and space. And I'll point out that one of the reasons I'm using psilocybin instead of LSD here on the far right is that as you can see, the LSD lasts longer and the, we feel that the psilocybin has similar effects. And if we can have that session end within about five to six hours, it allows us to treat this patient as an outpatient and send them home after their therapy session is done. If we had it extending past eight hours or so, we would need to keep them overnight, which we do for some of our studies, but typically for reasons other than um, making sure that they're out of their psychedelic experience. I forgot to mention ego dissolution, which is one of the more important things we think about a profound or strong psychedelic experience is that the sense of self is removed. And that sometimes is a uh, thought to be a helpful component so that someone can have sort of a, a third person look at themselves. So that's the mystical, spiritual sort of approach to why these things might help. And there is also fantastic work coming out of Switzerland with between uh, Preller and uh, Franz Vollenweider that have looked at fMRIs and EEGs to show that there are parts of the brain called the default mode networks that are illustrated here with these circles in the brain that are sort of gateways that control the, they're sort of like toll booths. They are gateways. They control what the brain is thinking about. And most of the time, we're not, our brain is, most of our brain is not engaged, okay? It's idle. And when they gave people psychedelics, it was shown that blood flow to these centers tended to decrease, decreasing the ability of these gateways, these, uh, uh, these controllers to control what the brain was thinking about. And the outcome of that, based on work uh, out of uh, uh, the London group, is that if you have the brain kind of talking to itself and across the brain in this fashion, normally when patients were given a psychedelic, the brain was able to talk to other parts of the brain that it doesn't normally get to talk to. And this may be accounting for some of that uh, unusual confusion of senses, for example, of sights having a smell to it or something like that. Uh, but also that we have the ability to address issues that perhaps are hidden or parked elsewhere in the brain protected, uh, perhaps their traumas, perhaps they're just unpleasant thoughts or um, what have you. We're not really sure which of these is most important, but it's, it may not actually be that we need a psychedelic experience at all to have this um, therapeutic benefit. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So it seems to have a benefit, is it safe? And one of the things that we do to protect the patients to try to make sure that individuals have a safe and therapeutic session with psilocybin uh, in a therapeutic setting, not a recreational uh -huh. setting, is that we have a, a process of screening the patients and preparing them, which typically takes, as you saw from the MDMA plot, uh, blot, <laughs> bar plot, 
uh, multiple sessions, about six to eight hours in total. And then we protect the space. We have the, the individuals attended uh, to reassure them if necessary, but to also protect them to make sure that they are safe and they can relax in a, their own sort of fashion. And then the following day, we bring them back to debrief for an integration session. And in total, we refer to this as the set and the setting, which is actually not a new term. It was uh, proposed, this whole process was proposed many years ago by Hubbard. And also even our friend Timothy Leary was, had mentioned set and setting. But this is part of the, the, the structure of a therapeutic session. And in a sense, we do treat it in many re respects like a ceremony and try to make it very special, almost sacred. We don't allow certain individuals with what we consider to be high-risk mental illnesses in the study. We feel that there's enough of a, um, a loss of what you're going to be thinking about caused by the psychedelics that we don't want to have individuals in the study who already have that issue. Okay, so we typically are screening for patients with schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, bipolar depression, manic disease. We have to taper the antidepressants that they're on. Um, because there's some data that suggests that it may blunt the effect of the psychedelic. There's also a theoretical argument that there may be serotonin syndrome where we have an additive effect of serotonin effects by the uh, psychedelics which are uh, acting at the serotonin receptor. There are some uh, slight differences in terms of different sites. I know that one um, site is looking at bipolar depression which I think is a, a good thing to be doing. And I think it's been done by a reputable group. And so that's a very interesting study to look at. So we've already sort of talked about the set and the preparation, talking about their life story, medication techniques that they can use. Interestingly, um, individuals who go through a psychedelic experience tend to be more likely afterwards to pick up meditation and to continue this kind of process of self-inspection. And then this is our treatment room at the School of Pharmacy here in Madison. You can see that it's a, a very comfortable looking room. Uh, the subject will lie on the sofa. It's a very long sofa, actually. I fit on it. Um, and then we've got the two chairs here for the, the psychedelic facilitators or guides. And these are individuals that have a, a mental health background, typically a, a PhD or an MD degree. We're not sure if that's going to be required for the psilocybin studies moving forward. But it is uh, at this point what the FDA is expecting and what the IRB is expecting. We're going to try to push back a little bit and have people who are trained uh, with a psilocybin environment to attend to the patients. When we're talking about the PTSD studies, though, with the MDMA, that's a more protocolized psychotherapy. We're going to have individuals that have arguably a higher level of qualifications to be dealing with patients with PTSD. So we're protecting this space. There, uh, the lights come down. This is too bright. The lights come down. We've got some nice subtle lighting and we make it a very special place. You can see over here, the, uh, the chalice that we use for the water and the uh, little cup that we use. The toxicities, what do we expect in terms of toxicities from psilocybin? Most people will get a headache in about eight to 12 hours. We typically treat that with acetaminophen and Tylenol. Uh, also, at about two hours at the peak experience, their heart rate goes up and their blood pressure goes up a little bit, and it comes down. We're not sure if that's a pharmacologic effect where it's like norepinephrine and we're going to stimulate the heart rate and the blood pressure anyway, or if it is just the excitement of the experience that they're having because it happens at the peak effect. So we're not sure. We've not had to treat anybody for high blood pressure or heart rate. It's not typically that, it's not even noticeable typically to the, the patient. And we have not had um, what you would call a bad trip that is uh, causing flashbacks. So uh, again, I, we feel that this is in part due to the preparation of the, the subjects. And importantly, something that frankly, I was not aware of before I started into this space, there's no evidence that LSD or psilocybin are addictive. That was one of the things when I grew up in the 70s, you know, it's, it's gonna make you, a, a, you're, it's going to change your DNA and, and uh, you're going to become addicted to these things. No evidence in animal studies or human studies that the psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin are addictive. There is a risk of MDMA or ecstasy having some addictive properties, 
But in the studies that have been used or done on patients, patients with PTSD, there's no evidence that these individuals have gone back and started abusing the MDMA or the ecstasy. So that's encouraging too. How do you blind a study that's using a psychedelic? How do you compare it to something where you want to fool them into thinking that they actually got this stuff? And we're not really sure that the FDA is completely sure either how to do this. People have used placebos, uh, niacin to kind of give you a flush, and give you a little bit of a heart rate increase. Uh, meth, uh, uh, Diphenhydramine can cause sort of some dysphoria, some sleepiness, a, lot, a little bit of loss of memory. And then methylphenidate Ritalin was also used to try to get uh, people's heart rates up. None of these really in any way sort of or fashion mimic the psychedelic experience. And so the uh, studies that are underway with MDMA, for example, are using placebo. And we expect that in the phase three registration trials of psilocybin, we are likely also to be using either uh, placebo or possibly SSRIs, the antidepressants. We're not really sure what those studies yet are going to look like. They haven't yet been started. We're not sure about how many doses to use. As I have mentioned, most of the depression studies for psilocybin have just used one dose. We don't know if a booster down the road would help and maintain that effect. We don't know in patients who did not have a complete response after one dose, if they would have a benefit of two or three more doses a month apart. Uh, we expect that since the companies that are trying to develop these drugs are pushing very hard to get it done as quickly as possible, and they're having such good results with one dose, that they'll probably go to the FDA with one dose uh, regimens. And that's what the FDA will approve. And then we'll come back and see money put in to see if in fact, we get any benefit from additional doses. But right now, the data I showed you for the depression was one dose. All right, same with PTSD and MDMA. Uh, we're getting giving three doses typically now. Dr. Rachel Yehuda at uh, the Bronx VA Mount, Mount Sinai is looking at whether or not two doses would be sufficient. <clears throat> well, frankly, we've got some of our patients in this PTSD study who have expressed, gosh, you know, I wish we, I had just one more session, one more dose, a fourth dose, so that I could kind of wrap this all up and kind of put it away. So maybe four doses instead of three. Um, one of the things that we're doing is trying to assess the importance of a mystical experience. We don't really know if there is a therapeutic benefit from that psychedelic experience. We've got, uh, some studies underway that are looking at substance use disorders, we're concerned that perhaps these individuals may have a higher tolerance to the psychedelics. And so we have in our studies, um, the ability to double the dose, quite honestly, in the second dose, if they didn't seem to have the effect that we were looking for, we're not sure yet that we're going to need that at this point. But we do have an interesting study that uh, does address that question of titration of the psychedelic experience. So let me talk a little bit about some of the trials that we've got underway now at the clinical trials. The first trial that we did where we cut our teeth, if you will, on psychedelics was done several years ago, reported out about five years ago. And this was with psilocybin that was synthesized by Dr. Nick Cozy over here on the right. Uh, one of our uh, graduate student uh, alums did, a, uh, did work with David Nichols at Purdue and then came back and synthesized our psilocybin, which is as pure as the driven snow. And this has also been used in other studies at Yale and elsewhere, our team here. And these graphs over here kind of portray one of the more significant things that I think came out of our study in addition to the understanding that we could push to higher doses than we typically are going to want to use in the future, but that we didn't have to weigh out every dose for every person's weight every time, that we could use a flat dose. It didn't really matter if we were um, using a flat dose or a weight adjusted dose, there was so much overlap in these gray and these green plots that we persuaded the FDA in subsequent studies that we can just use 25 milligrams of the psilocybin, the pure psilocybin. So we also pushed um, from about 25 milligrams here with a 0.3 milligram per kilogram dose to twice that. And we really didn't show any more prevalent uh, an incidence of, of side effects 
than at the lower dose. So that was encouraging too. I'm going to admit this person so I... There we go. Um, we have an interesting study underway right now, which is the study in patients who are opioid abusers taking Suboxone. We're asking several questions. Can we even recruit these individuals? A really tough group to try to find and to persuade to be in a study. Can we retain them? Can we put them through that entire process of preparation and the dosing? And then does the psilocybin increase any toxicities of the buprenorphine? We're particularly looking at cardiac toxicities um, based on some small signal we had with the psilocybin. And does the suboxone blunt the psychedelic experience? There's some evidence in animal models that it might. So we're excited about this, but of course, one of the underlying questions that we're not, uh, you know, we don't want to say this is making or breaking the study. We're going to be looking at the question, do these individuals who are uh, already taking suboxone to try to prevent them from having withdrawal symptoms from opioids, are they still going out and taking as many other illicit drugs on the street as they were before they were taking? Because most of the individuals on suboxone are taking other illicit drugs. Can we reduce that as sort of a signal that this might be helping? But this phase one study is a safety trial. It's a feasibility study. And so we are um, we're using this as a model largely just to make sure that we can actually find these people and bring them in and keep them for the duration of the study. These individuals will be getting two doses of psilocybin. As I said, for the second dose, they've got the option of doubling the dose. Most opioid users are not under doctor's uh, watch or kind of counsel patient. The individuals that we are recruiting would be under the care of a physician who's writing for the suboxone uh, sublingual film. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if, if most opioid abusers are under a doctor's care. Um, we're Here's hoping our... that more, more individuals will be getting access to the buprenorphine suboxone, which is easier to prescribe and easier to get than the methadone that many people were using many years ago. It's hard to get to methadone clinics on a regular basis for many people. This is our, um, our team that is focused on substance use disorders. And we also have a study that is, uh, just came out of the IRB, the Human Subjects Committee with a couple of recommendations and questions. Randy Brown is a family medicine physician, uh, addic an addictionologist. And Chris Nicholas is a, a clinical psychologist. And he is uh, one of the leads, not only in treating our subjects with um, the psychedelics and MDMA, but he is recognized nationally and internationally as one of the trainers uh, for both the PTSD work with MDMA and with psilocybin for depression and other indications. We have a problem with methamphetamine. You can see that the incidence of mortality of deaths associated with methamphetamine is rapidly rising. And uh, from this slightly old plot, we can see that prescription opioid deaths rose in the early 200s, 2000s, sorry, <laughs> but has not grown uh, as rapidly. We've got a real problem with met, uh, methamphetamine because we have no drugs like methadone to control their craving for it. And so we have high hopes that this uh, the study will show that we do have a benefit. But again, we're looking at feasibility. Can we recruit? Can we retain? And can we uh, treat these patients safely with the psilocybin? And then another study that we're really excited about, uh, that was a brainchild of Dr. Chuck Razan, a psychiatrist, Matthew Banks, a neuropharmacologist, as is Cody Wenther, who's a new hire in our School of Pharmacy, brilliant young fellow, is the recap study. And here's the, here's the premise of the recap. We're going to take normal volunteers and we're going to give them a dose of psilocybin so that they have a really impressive, profound psychedelic experience. And we're trying to give them doses of midazolam with an anesthesiologist's care so that with this light sedation, they will not remember their psychedelic experience. Just like I'm not supposed to remember the details of my colonoscopy, right? <laughs> well, if we can do that, and if we can do that safely and find out how we dose the midazolam, then the next step will be taking patients who are suffering from depression and finding out 
if, if we can suppress the memory of that psychedelic experience, do they still have a therapeutic benefit? Or is that psychedelic experience fundamental and a requisite required for the therapeutic benefit? And if it is, it raises all sorts of questions, including do we need to titrate the psychedelic experience? Do we need to have some sort of a threshold of psychedelic experience <clears throat> for them? And I, I, I think it's going to be a, a, an exciting study to look at. We've only dosed two people so far. So far, there's absolutely no evidence that we have suppressed their memory at all. One of the concerns that we've got is whether or not it might actually be enhancing the memory. Yes, Tom. Uh, Sam online has uh, raised his hand. Sam, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Sure. Um, so my original question was, I want to ask if the psilocybin used was synthetic or magic mushroom, but you answered it that it was synthetic. But uh, I also kind of want to, ask about uh, the lack of placebo in some of the trials uh, shown, like the car heart, heart study. And you mentioned how uh, it's just hard to create placebo groups for psilocybin or just psychedelic experiences. So could you just speak on how the validity of these experiments is affected because there's a lack of placebo trials, especially for like in terms of FDA approval in the future? If you want to answer that now, that's great. It sounds like it's going to be a sustained answer if you want to address that at the end. So the question was, uh, is the lack of a useful placebo going to affect the FDA's interpretation of the results of this, uh, of psilocybin for various indications, substance use disorder and depression? First, it'll be depression. And I, I don't... I don't think it's going to be a problem uh, with depression. I think they probably will be using a placebo in part because we, we have, that's the way that the SSRIs like Prozac and uh, sertraline were studied. They were studied against placebos. And in fact, as I showed you, there was about a 30 to 40% response rate to placebo. So I'm expecting the same to happen with psychedelics, even though they are not having they should not have the same level of a psychedelic experience. They're still getting a, a about 10 to 20 hours of counseling and focused attention. And I think that that will, um, uh, that could very well have a therapeutic benefit. I expect a therapeutic benefit just from that. So I think we will be using a placebo for the psilocybin trials. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So one of the points I'm going to, I wanted to make is that we're going to have normal volunteers stepping forward for this recap study. I think they're going to be somewhat disappointed if we're successful because they won't remember their psychedelic experience. But so far, they're remembering it. So we have to up the dose of the I think. There are all sorts of various uh, compounds. Sorry, there are all sorts of various indications that we and others would like to look at. They include the substance use disorders that I've already talked about. Migraine headaches, something that Yale is, is leading the way on. Uh, they, there seems to be a benefit in cluster and migraine headaches. Eating disorders, a tough crowd to try to treat, uh, to recruit and, and to treat. I, I believe that uh, University of Florida is looking at that, as is Johns Hopkins. I don't know how successful they are in getting uh, subjects. Fibromyalgia, we think, is a, a strong candidate for work with psychedelics. Uh, we already have some evidence of benefit from MDMA for PTSD, but we think that perhaps combining MDMA for trust building and the psychedelic effect of psilocybin afterwards might be a useful combination. We'd like to look at stroke, chronic clint pain, uh, not only the nerve neuropathies or nerve pain, but also perhaps some lower back pain. We think that there might be some benefits in this population that has a chronic difficult to treat pain that may be causing disability. And if we could improve their ability to function, that would be a huge impact on their lives in a good way. And then also one of my pet interests, given my background in palliative care and oncology, is prolonged grief. There's a lot of interest in depression and anxiety, existential distress in patients who are, are um, dying of various diseases, typically cancer. And there are those that really want to promote the use of psychedelics to ease their existential distress. I'm also concerned about the caregivers or the parents who have lost suddenly or after a long battle, a loved one, a child or a spouse, and are unable to move past that. 
and that is in a form a form of disability as well that I'd like to take a look at. But all this, as you might imagine, uh, takes uh, money. Now you might say, well, how can stroke and some of these other things possibly be associated with the psychedelic experience? And again, I'll go back to the comment I made where it may not be necessary for an individual to have a psychedelic experience with this category of drugs. And uh, David Olson at the University of California Davis has done some really great work showing that drugs of this class with this basic chemical structure, but with slight uh, changes that take away what we think are the psychedelic uh, components of it, seem in animal models to increase the number of spikes of branches on the neurons and increases the number of synapses. So what he's calling the psychoneuroplast uh, sorry, sorry, psychoplastogens may be a reason why we see some healing, why we see some durable effects. There may be some other uh, factors such as epigenetics where the masking of some of the DNA can be modified using the psychedelics. This may explain why over a period of hours, we can have a durable effect that lasts months or years. We're not sure, but again, this is one of the reasons why our center is the Transdisciplinary Center for Research in Psychoactive Substances, because we're not really sure that everything we are going to be looking at needs to give a psychedelic experience. There may be some non-psychedelic, but still psychoactive changes that can occur with these drugs. So a little bit more about the center. We have a multiple individuals on campus. Um, we're learning about more every day, it seems after we announced it, of individuals who have an interest in psychedelics or this, uh, the culture of the psychedelics. English faculty, uh, English uh, and journalism faculty, history faculty. We have a challenge in terms of finding the resources, the rooms to treat the individuals. And we're hoping that with the additional credibility that the center designation provides, that we can go to various uh, places and find additional treatment sites. Because if you think about it, with all the counseling and the eight hour dosing session, that locks up our study room for at least two, probably three days per week for every patient that we're treating. And so we've got a pinch point there. And there are a couple of places that I think we've identified that is going to allow us to expand our sites. But now we've got to find the individuals to sit with them, to prepare them and to guide them. And so finding those individuals, training them is going to be a challenge for us. Part of the way that we're doing that is with our new Master of Science in Psychoactive Pharmaceutical Investigation, which is going to be, I think, uh, a real key component in our educational program. And I'll talk in a slide or two about that a little bit more. So we're trying also uh, to expand our reach, not only to University of Wisconsin-Madison, but the other UW system schools and the state as, as a whole, the Wisconsin idea in general. But in particular, we're looking at uh, improved access for underserved groups. I mentioned how studies even in Baltimore had very remarkable underrepresentation of blacks and other minorities. We need to fix that. And I had, um, I've had some really great conversations with leaders in the black community. We're going to be setting up some listening sessions to find out what their concerns are, but also what the barriers are. I mean, coming back and forth for these preparation sessions, uh, the eight hour session, how are you going to get there? Do you have a car? Do you have parking? What are we going to do about your kids if you're a single parent? All sorts of things that I think are going to uh, add up and we're going to have to consider this in our retention of subjects. The other thing that we're doing with our, uh, our center is to develop scholarships and postdoctoral support as we try to develop individuals for this new area of therapy because it's going to happen really quite quickly uh, the FDA approval of MDMA and psilocybin is coming very, very soon. We also have some other scholars on campus that have a, uh, an interest in meditation and consciousness. Uh, let me ask you the group here, uh, just because I, sh I should have asked at the beginning. Who in this group has ever had an altered state of consciousness? Anybody had an altered state of consciousness? A few hands, I'd say about a fifth of the people in this room are raising their hands. Did you sleep last night? That's no. an altered state of consciousness, isn't it? Meditation, sleep, 
these are all variations on a theme of consciousness. And one of the things that Dr. Giulio, uh, Giulio Tononi in the Department of Psychiatry and the head of the Sleep Studies Lab here has been looking at. And he's very excited about trying to find how the psychedelic experience and sleep interact. So we're very excited to be working with him. We've also got Alberto Vargas, who's looking at psychedelics as incorporated into Latin American studies. Simon Goldberg is on uh, sabbatical right now, looking at mental health and veterans, but also in machine learning and uh, how it integrates with mindfulness and, and feedback processes. And even in CALS, uh, Dr. Jess Reed has developed a novel dosage form that may facilitate the safe and uh, controllable uh, secured delivery of, of uh, psychedelics. So we're excited to be working with all these individuals, again, from across campus. Lucas Rickert um, is, I'm gonna move my bar here if I can. Uh, Lucas Rickert is a historian. He's in the School of Pharmacy, and he is uh, also the head of the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy. He's written several books on illicit drugs, recreational medications, and is one of our key members of the, the uh, center. Natalie Schmitz, a uh, recent hire, is working with cannabinoids and symptom clusters in cancer patients. And she, actually, she was a, uh, she's a pharmacist who was working in a cannabis dispensary in Minnesota, which is uh, one of the ways that uh, like somewhat controlled the access to this cannabis is by having these uh, uh, dispensaries with pharmacists involved. And then Ed Elder on the right, he leads the Z Pharmaceutical Experiment Station, which is a laboratory at the School of Pharmacy that is able to quantify the purity, stability of various compounds. And so actually we've got a company this week in town that is working with him on their new psychedelic compound, asking him to verify the, uh, the purity and the content of it. So uh, we used him for our, our psilocybin studies many years ago, and he is proving to be a resource, not only for us, but across the country. Here are our leaders. You've seen most of these individuals already. These are the uh, members of our executive committee. We're also pleased to have uh, Dr. Jeanette Roberts, our uh, former dean of the School of Pharmacy on our committee. One of the things you'll notice is that this is predominantly old white guys. And we're trying to fix that too. Uh, we have multiple individuals on campus that are in the space, a little bit new to the space, but we are trying very much uh, to develop uh, not only our advisory committee, which is much more diverse than this, but also to develop uh, researchers that um, will be successful not only in developing these studies, but also obtaining funding for them. So we're expecting that this will change over several years. Things are going to happen very quickly. The expectation is that the MDMA is probably going to be approved by the FDA in about uh, two years, maybe less. Uh, 2023 is our bet, might be 24, if there are some problems that pop up. But we have not yet seen them. I think that's that's our expert, their expectation. And if that's the case, then we have to be ready with the therapists to meet the demand of PTSD in battle trauma, first responders, sexual trauma. There's going to be a huge demand for these treatment facilities, but especially for these individuals that are qualified to care for them, to prepare them and to treat them. And so we need to get going. I'm trying to, there would like, I'd like to get a bill through uh, the state uh, here in Wisconsin that calls for individuals to be credentialed as a psychedelic facilitator. You don't want somebody coming off the street and saying, hey, I'll, I'll watch you. And one of the most sensitive, uh, uh, suggestible uh, moments of your entire life. And so we're, we're trying to establish what those credentials should look like. And they probably will be a little bit different between PTSD treatment and depression, I'll be honest with you. Uh, different levels of, of treatment and Chris Nicholas is going to be one of those I think that is going to have um, a great deal to say both in the state and nationally uh, about that. And then psilocybin probably going to be approved a few years after that for depression. Quite a few people in the world in the United States with depression. I think there's going to be a huge demand. We have people calling us every day asking about how they get again in the study with refractory depression. And we have the expectations that there's going to be a huge demand for that as well. How are we going to have the facilities to do that? We're not really sure. 
that um, we're going to be able to do it alone as a center, but we're going to try with our uh, collaborative work on campus to do that. You can see that the number, the interest in psychedelics with psilocybin publications rising dramatically. We feel that one of the things, as I mentioned, is this master's program that we can use to train individuals who want to get a credible uh, experience and credentials in the psychedelic space. Cody Winther, who I already mentioned um, previously with our recap study, is the director of that master's program. We have it both as a master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences, but also as a capstone certificate, which is shorter and highlights a few components of that. And this is going to be an online degree. We already have uh, our first class entered this fall. We were hoping for 14 and we were full, as you might imagine, with 30 plus. And so it's been very well received. We hope to place these individuals as interns in various uh, psychedelic companies that are burgeoning around the country and the world. And um, again, this is the first in the country. You know, I think that we're going to have a, a, a great crop of individuals coming out of the program. Yes. So looking at these people being trained online, and it's very important that they meet some basic criteria. How are you going to be able to screen them? I mean, today, most online education, the kids put up the answers in the book and they have to test. So um, what components of testing are you putting in there? So the question is, how are we going to assure the quality and the competency of these individuals that are taking the course online, as you say? Mm -hmm. And I agree, that is a challenge for any type of program or assessment. And I think, quite honestly, uh, in my course, uh, as an example, psychedelics and science and society in a, in a year and a half, I'm going to be relying on discussions and papers written as opposed to uh, looking something up. But I think the other thing that you're inferring is how are you going to make these people uh, prepared to serve as facilitators or guides for therapeutic sessions? And that's not the intent of this master's program. These individuals are intended to serve as uh, members of the scientific community in the various companies that are being formed to develop the compounds. Uh, we expect that many of them may already be guides and may already at some point be credentialed based on their being grandfathered in, if you will, in some sense, because of their prior experience. But we also are looking at taking some of these individuals and providing another internship or clerkship that they can be mentored and observed and qualified to serve as guide. Because you're right, an online uh, correspondence course to be a psychedelic guide, I don't think is going to be appropriate. Yeah, and neither do the members of our team. It's a great question. Yes. Isn't there a 12 unit course offered for psychiatrists? Is a special accreditation uh, in this program? There is a uh, course, I believe it's through MAPS uh, for psychiatrists, but I'm not familiar with its content. And so I don't really think I can I can speak authoritatively on that. I was led to believe that it's that that course, that's already on course, could be applied to the 21 credit unit for the master's program. So I would assume that there's considerable overlap. I'm not and familiar with that. That's the other question. How do, how do you ensure uh, that the facilitator is of the quality and experience? Basically, people who are licensed already in mental uh, especially, once again, especially the psychiatrists. I, I know the pharmacists may disagree with this, but you know, it would it would basically be like uh, and, and the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, has looked at a special credential in in, in the. So you've indicated, and let me just repeat for the audience: uh, your question is about the twelve. Credits that uh, 12 hours, 12 credits. For credits, and, and they're directly applicable. I mean, if the manual is correct, just mm -hmm. of uh, uh, permissible to add them into and speak to the 21 units that are credits uh, of the masters. I don't know that that's true for our masters. It may be for. Uh, for uh, CE or CME. I, I can't answer that question of whether or not those 12 credits for psychiatrists is applicable. I, I apologize for my ignorance on that. 
your your point about the qualifications for study guides, I think you're right about the PTSD and MDMA work, that that most likely will be individuals who are already certified and credentialed by the state, psychiatrists or psychologists to lead that team. The other individual in that team, if we're still requiring two individuals, perhaps they don't need that same level of skill. Maybe it's somebody that would be able to lead a psilocybin session by themselves, but not an MDMA session for PTSD. Yes. In the movement forward of ketamine. Yes. Yeah. And ketamine is one of those studying drugs on a planet mm -hmm. for children. I've given tons of children ketamine over the years. Yep. I have to go to the kid and I've done it. Um, mm -hmm. But that was entirely done and administered to the best of my ability by physicians, mostly psychiatrists, uh, for obvious reasons you're dealing with an anesthetic. Where you're talking about these things, maybe the reverse anesthetics and uh, neuroplasticity coming in. You know, but the reality of most of our psychedelics is we don't have any idea what the treatment of LD50 would be for any of these. You talked about reoccurrences of problems like addiction. Well, it turns out that Dr. Hoffman. Who later on the passion is like for his acid diethylamide. And he also shares passion with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, started uh, actually giving lysergic acid LSD to American troops and testing them. These were a cross section group, uh, presumptively in their 20s, maybe 30s. Uh, and even though they are an aging population, they might be a good meta study to look back and see how that has affected them. And those records theoretically could be available uh, to treatment. Uh, That's a great idea to try to find those individuals that were treated by the CEA, CIA, or the uh, Army uh, with LSD. To see. Out their social security. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, everybody seems to have mine. Uh, um, and the other point was about ketamine and the fact that that already is administered under prescription by an authorized prescriber who is able to prescribe for controlled substances. And I, I agree that that is probably going to be a similar case with a psilocybin and MDMA. Uh, however, there are a lot of ketamine clinics popping up because it is lucrative. And there is, uh, I think, a lost opportunity in many respects because these clinics may just have the patient getting a squirt of the ketamine sitting there for the required time, but not having this integration, not having the, the two individuals working with them during the session, preparing them before they have these doses. And we feel that that is, uh, this, this may explain why some individuals don't seem to have the benefit from ketamine that others do. And so we feel that this is not the right, the ketamine is not the right model. Uh, we feel that more of a ceremonial, uh, separate, almost sacred environment that, that is protected for them is going to be more helpful than a sterile clinic room. Well, looking at the Native American church. Yes. And that's the And ayahuasca. And South America, these diseases are found to be extraordinarily effective in addictive disorders, but surrounded by a ritualistic experience. Just like uh, smoking tobacco for, for Native American means something different to a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, drinking wine for Catholic means something different. <laughs> But when held in a ceremonial container, right. you have less aversion to loss because it has a context. That's true. So repeat the, the point that the Native American church looking at peyote, mescaline, and the ayahuasca in the Central and South American uh, cultures, again, is a, a very much a ceremony, uh, and that it is done as a group. Now, a lot of that has been somewhat usurped by psychedelic tourism, and maybe there are some corners that are cut, but in this, and I, I can't, I've not been to any of these ceremonies, um, but our concern is that uh, we take from that 
knowledge, that tradition, the importance of a protected space, a ceremony associated with it, with intention, as opposed to I want to see the bright lights and the and the the, the psychedelic experience. So that that, that answer your your point? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Sir. Yeah, I had a follow up on the Kennedy thing about ten years ago. I, I think I heard that uh, Kennedy was really effective, like uh, in vitro at the repairing synaptic um, connections, and there was. People had some hope that maybe they could just maybe remove some of the uh, the the, the, um, you know, the psychiatric effects and just have it be just for you know synaptic repair. That might be a good for a treating depression. Has there been any progress on that, or is that just like a, a bright hope that uh, that flames out? I I do not know that we have. I've not seen that to the extent that I've looked at psilocybin, but there may be literature that I've just not. Uncovered the looks of that. But if it works for psilocybin or other psychedelic or related drugs, it may be working with ketamine as well. Even though they're working at different receptors, they may have an, uh, an effect in terms of expression of DNA that's not, not mutations, but just the ability to express certain parts of DNA. The other thing I wanted to point out about these ketamine clinics that are popping up before I move on is that uh, they are sort of a Trojan horse, if you will. The, the individuals and companies are trying to create these ketamine clinics. Granted, they, there is a therapeutic benefit for many individuals with depression. It doesn't seem to be as durable as a psilocybin. But by putting these clinics in place, it will be easier for them to implement psilocybin dosing down the road or presumably MDMA. But again, we have concerns about what that, uh, what that treatment will look like. Will be a treatment or will it be a ceremony? Are these all courses offered right now? Uh, no. My course, uh, the Psychedelic Drugs in Science and Society, for example, is not scheduled until next year, the spring of 23. But we have, uh, many of them are already underway. I, I actually can't remember I think uh, CNS Drug Design Sections Applications 1 is underway right now. Two will be next year or next semester. And in the School of Pharmacy. Yes, it's based on the School of Pharmacy. So um, we're, we're, we're at uh, full enrollment and I'm very, very excited about that. We've got uh, some donors that we'd like to acknowledge, particularly Mike and Mary Sue Shannon for the support that they're giving the recap study. But also, WARF, uh, Revive Therapeutics, is helping us with the methamphetamine use disorder. We started out with Hefter Research Institute for Opioid Use Disorder, but COVID shut us down. Uh, last year, they did so much clinical research. We kept our trained staff online, but we burned up our, our monies. And so right now, this important study is being funded by Dr. Brown's uh, retention fund, and we're hoping to find some additional funding for that. Um, and so one of the, the problems is that uh, we don't have the, the scope of commercial uh, interest in these compounds that uh, we might normally see with a pharmaceutical company. We also don't have federal grants yet to look at these, although the federal grant opportunities may increase. We've got all sorts of opportunities here uh, for outreach at the center level, for educational symposia, scholarships I've already mentioned, outreach activities to underrepresented groups, including our, uh, education, but also facilitating your participation. And then we also have a Wisconsin Psychedelic Research and Education Fund under the UW Foundation. Uh, it's, we can't really, Google kind of limits psychedelic searches. Uh, so we have to send you to support uw.org and then have you look for the psychedelic fund. Uh, and so, we're not really sure what this outreach activity is going to look like for underrepresented groups. You know, I, I kid about um, having a, uh, a mystery machine, but do we need something like an RV where we can go to, to the rural parts of the, of the state where they may not have these trained facilitators to provide the environment, the controlled environment? On the other hand, I would argue that perhaps we should be working with the shaman or the healers of the Hmong population and the uh, Native American tribes to incorporate the psilocybin into their ceremonies and basically not impose our guides upon them, but use the ones that they already have. So we're, we're excited about that. We're 
Um, we're beginning conversations uh, with that, and we hope to move forward in this next year with that. I'm going to stop with just some contact information for me. Um, I will respond quickly if you email me. And if I don't, you probably misspelled my name with a D as in David instead of a T as in Tom. So it's Paul Hudson. Send me an email. Cody Winther is in charge of our master's program. He's going to be a great resource for any questions you've got about the master's and the PPI. And I welcome any additional questions that you've got. And thank you very much for your attention.